grew up in Iowa. It's 1986, I'm six years old. And there I am, the lone brown girl. I'm pedaling my older brother's dirt bike down the street from my house and I'm not allowed to go far. So I just go back and forth between two street corners and beside me is a creek. And I hear the cicadas sing and I'm going back and forth and ah, I feel a sharp pain in my arm and my bike just seems to come up from under me. And I'm lying there on the sidewalk. I must have gotten stung by a bee. And then I look over and I see some boys across the creek and they're laughing at me. This is so embarrassing. They're laughing at me because I fell down like a doofus. And then something blossoms inside of me. And my body goes numb and I feel like I'm floating. And I walk home and I think, I got stung by a bee. Finally, now I can tell the other kids that I too have been stung by a bee. And then I get home and I see my parents and my brother and sister and the pain comes back in my heart. And I just start crying. And my mom is like, oh boy, what happened this time? Can't you stay out of trouble? Like, I got stung by a bee and my parents examined my arm and it's swelling and bruising. They're like, this doesn't look like a bee sting. Who are you with? No one. Well, who did you see? No one. Well, who are you with? And I'm like, well, there are those boys across the creek, but I wasn't playing with them. I don't even know them. And then my brother is like, well, what do these guys look like? Um, well, one had red hair and glasses and his friend was goofy looking. Oh, that's Philip Dowd. He lives across the street from Aaron. So we walk back outside. My big brother's leading the charge and we see Philip and his goofy looking friend and Philip's dad is there and my dad and him talk, but I can't really understand what they're saying. But then I hear Philip's dad say, I got him a BB gun for his birthday but he won't be using that for a while. He's grounded. Yikes, grounded. Fast forward to my 20s. I'm at a big family gathering and everyone's sitting around the living room eating Indian food and we're talking about our favorite films. And I'm like this cultured liberal arts student. So I'm like, my favorite film of all time has got to be The Godfather. I just find it very relatable. <laughs> My brother is like, relatable, why? Because of your time with the Italian mob? What? I'm gangster. Actually, I've been shot before, remember? In Iowa? You know that sound when everyone is still and uncomfortable? So I explained, no, it was random. There are these boys shooting BB gun, birds with BB guns, and then they accidentally shot me. And I look at my brother for validation. He looks at me, not sure how to say it. I mean, that, that wasn't an accident. <sighs> All these memories started flooding back. Kids telling me my skin looked like poop. To go back to my own country, my fourth grade teacher giving me poor behavioral marks, no matter how well I tried to behave. Me, an obedient, studious Asian kid, poor behavior. Sometimes when I'm putting my four-year-old daughter to sleep and we're lying in the dark, these memories invade me like the bee sting memory. And I'm gripped with anxiety for my daughter. How am I going to protect her? From this world, how will I raise her white? My childhood, it didn't look like those loving white families on Thursday night sitcoms. I don't have the tools. I feel damaged. The other day, I was watching Mr. Rogers with my daughter, which is such a great show. And she points to people on the screen. She says, Mommy, that man is black, and that woman is white, and Mr. Rogers is white. And I said, Yes, and, and you're brown, you have brown skin. She already knows this we've talked about race at great length but this time she responds ew i don't like brown i tried to stay calm 
Why don't you like brown, sweetie? I just like bright colors like red and blue and yellow and orange, like colors of the rainbow. Brown is not a very bright color. Oh, <laughs> she's talking about crayon colors. Or is she? It's 1993 and I'm 13. I'm visiting my nani, my maternal grandmother in India, New Delhi. And nani yells when she talks. Like every time she speaks, she sounds like she's fucking pissed. She just has to let it all out every time. She's my favorite person in the world. She keeps looking at me and saying, you know, you look just like Mataji. You have her eyes. Who's that? Mata, she's my great grandmother. She was illiterate when she was 16. And then when she married at 16, she was forced like many women of her time to just live with her in-laws and basically become their slave. So one morning, Mataji's mother-in-law shows her an entire shack full of cotton and an old wooden lever. And she says, weave all of this tomorrow and we'll sell it in the village. Mataji was like, what is it? Her mother was like, don't you know how clothes are made? And as she walks away, she mutters, Ulukapata. what a stupid owl. Mataji is now alone and she's tinkering around with the wooden weaver and something starts to blossom inside of her. And the next day, Mataji takes her mother-in-law to the shack to show her the work they did. And they look inside and all the cotton is gone. Wait, it actually looks like it's been burned. And Mataji is shocked. She's like, I don't know what could have happened. It must've been an accident. Maybe there were men, there were men like smoking here yesterday. They probably threw a cigarette in there. And that was that, nothing could be done. Well. What her mother-in-law didn't know is that the night before, while everyone was asleep, Mataji went to the shack, lit a match, and dropped it into the pile of cotton, and <sighs> flames go up before her face. And then she placed the matchbox inside her sari blouse. But what her mother-in-law also didn't know was that every night in their tiny bungalow, while everyone was asleep, she nestled herself in a cot and took the matchbox out to light a candle and would teach herself to read. And if anyone or anything got in her way, she would burn that motherfucker to the ground. The other day I woke up and I heard, mommy, mommy, wake up, it's morning time. My daughter takes me away and she starts dancing and singing so free and expressive. I just want to bottle it up and keep it forever. And then the questions come back. They pop in my head like, how will I teach my daughter, an Asian American woman, to be brave in the face of wounds that sting like a bee? Sometimes they're so subtle. You don't even know they exist until they come exploding out of you unexpectedly. <sighs> and then I notice my daughter's eyes twinkling as she dances. Her eyes are just like mine. She has my eyes. I could tell her she doesn't need to make herself small. She can yell loudly. And if shit gets in her way, It's May 13th, 1981. I'm 13 years old and I'm, I'm watching TV with my parents. We're watching The Greatest American Hero. Do, 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 do. Then suddenly the news and gentlemen, Pope John Paul II has been shot. Ah, ah, my mother gasps. Yes, our dear beloved Pope has been shot by a Turkish terrorist by the name of Mehmet Ali Aja. Ah, uh, ah, uh, my mother says again, Nichin, why? My father says, 
because this man, he is contact. He's crazy and he's an idiot. I look at both my parents and I say, I'm not going to school tomorrow. Why? My father says, um, hello, my name is Bilgin Turker. I, sh I might as well be called Bilgin Turkish. I'm the only Turk in school. You should be proud of your name, my father says. Your name is my name. My name is your name. And this man, this idiot, he doesn't represent all Turks. You're going to school. So I go to school the next day, but I tell you, I am a ghost. I float through the hallways. I walk in the shadows. I don't make eye contact with anybody. I don't drink water. I don't eat lunch. I don't laugh at jokes. I just float to each class all day long until my last class of the day, social studies. And I float to the door and I float inside the room and I sit at my desk quietly. And I take out my paper and I put it on the desk. And the only place I will look is at my paper and at the teacher, Mrs. Morgenstern, at my paper and at the teacher. And as I'm looking at the teacher in the corner of my eye, in walks Michelle, another schoolmate. She's wearing this big pink sweatshirt and she has a large button on one shoulder. And it says, I heart Pope John Paul II. And it's a profile also of the Pope like this. And on the other side, she has a, another huge button that says, kiss me, I'm Polish. So I quickly look down because I don't want to make eye contact with her. I look at the teacher and I look down. And as I try to look up again, I hear snickering coming diagonally from me. And it's Bobby. <laughs> hey, turkey lurkey. You trying to hide? <laughs> Did you hear? Did you hear? He says with his Hawaiian punch stained mouth. Usually he's eating a ton of gummy worms. That's why his mouth looks like a bag of worms and his cheeks, they're filled with freckles and pimples and I can't tell the difference. And his hair is all matted and brown and he's staring at me with his beady eyes. <laughs> a Turkish guy shot the Pope. <laughs> you related him? Is he your father? Is he your brother? Is he your cousin? You gonna marry him one day? <laughs> Did you guys celebrate when the Pope got shot? Bet you did. Pope killer, Pope killer, Pope killer, Pope killer. And all I can do is say, shut up, shut up. As he gets louder and louder, Pope killer, Pope killer, Pope killer. And he's pointing at me, Pope killer, Pope killer, Pope killer. And the other students are looking around and kind of nervously laughing. And then my teacher finally interrupts. Okay, Bobby. Be quiet. We're all praying that the poop gets better. Now, today is study buddy day for our hieroglyphics. And I want to pair everybody up. And Bobby, you're going to be paired up with Harold. Now move it. And Bilgen, I'm going to pair you up with Michelle. Michelle? Why? Why, Michelle? I pick up my trapper keeper and my book bag and my paper and I make my way to her. And I feel like someone's yelling out, Turkish girl walking, Turkish girl walking, Turkish girl walking. And as I'm getting closer to her, I hear Pukula, 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 Pukula. And I swear, the Pope on the button looks at me and says, Pukula, pukula. I sit down. Michelle looks at me, braces in her teeth. Hi, Bill again. Hi, Michelle. I'm sorry that I shot the Pope. What? I, I mean, I, I, I didn't shoot the Pope. I mean, I, I'm sorry that a Turkish girl, Turkish guy shot the Pope, okay? I look, I, I'm not related to him. I don't know him. I'm not gonna even marry him, okay? But, and my family, we're really sad that the Pope got... I just, look, I just wanted to tell you that I'm sorry, okay? Michelle looks at me. Oh, well, my mom said that um, Pope's going to be okay. Um, and you know what? He even forgave the guy that shot him. Oh, really, I say? 
Mm, that's nice of him. Yeah. Were you born in Turkey? No, no, no. I, I, was, I was born in Brooklyn. Oh, have you ever been to Turkey? Once, when I was four, but it was such a long time ago. I don't remember anything. Oh, you know, last summer, we, um, my family and I, we went to Turkey and uh, we were at this island called uh, Kas Kasaydisi, 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 Kush Adisa. Yeah. Oh, that's Bird Island. I've always wanted to go there, but that's, that's cool. Yeah, and then we had these things called um, Burks, Bereki, Burex, Burex. Oh yeah, they're really good. <laughs> Does your mom make them? Um, yeah, sometimes. Oh, well, maybe you could bring it in for like um, International Food Day. Maybe I say. <laughs> I guess we got to look at these hieroglyphics. We both looked down at the hieroglyphics. And suddenly the, the lines and the squiggles of the hieroglyphics make sense to me. I put the blank paper in front of me and I take out my number two pencil and I write at the top of my page, Bilgen Turker. T U R K E R. <laughs> so tonight I want to tell you all something about myself that not many people know. It's about a passion of mine. I am abnormally preoccupied with collecting jackets. And I don't know what it is about jackets, but I love them. I probably own about 15 of them right now. And uh, I know that there are people who say that we shouldn't place too much value on material possessions, but I think certain items jewelry, cars, shoes, and actually even some jackets are basically works of art, which reminds me of one jacket in particular. Uh, I'm about to graduate junior high school. I'm 14 years old, and I need a jacket to wear to graduation. Uh, and my grandmother, who I live with, tells me that the next day she's going to give me money to go shopping. And I'm so excited. I can hardly sleep that night. I'm like a kid on Christmas Eve. So I wake up bright and early Saturday morning. I take the B-52 bus downtown Brooklyn, walk along Fulton Mall to one of my favorite stores, Jimmy Jazz. And for those of you who don't know, Jimmy Jazz is the best kept secret in the five boroughs whatever the occasion, they are gonna hook you up. So I walk into the store and it doesn't take long before I spot the one. The jacket that I must, must, must have for graduation. Lime green pleather with gold buttons. It's double-breasted, collarless. It has tons of pleating in the front and it's cropped short to come just to my waist. So I try it on and I'm in love. And there's no need to look any further. I just pay for my treasure and I head home vibrating with excitement. When I arrive back home, as is customary, I try the jacket on for my grandmother so that she can ins inspect the fit. And uh, she's at the sink doing dishes when she looks up to see me modeling my newest jewel and her jaw drops along with the plate she's holding which crashes into the sink and judging from her reaction it becomes immediately clear to me that I look even better than I thought 
So I do a little spin so that she can get the full effect from all angles. And I ask, what do you think? And she shakes her head and says, take it back. And for a minute, I think I must be hearing things, but then she says, it's not appropriate for the occasion. And I immediately start begging and pleading to keep the jacket with tears welling in my eyes, but she won't budge. And honestly, I shouldn't be surprised by her reaction because grownups are so lame and they have the worst taste in everything, music, food, TV shows, and especially fashion. Have you seen mom jeans? So anyway, I storm off with my jacket and lock myself in the bathroom. And I lay in the tub, holding my beloved jacket, knowing that we will soon be parted. And then I suddenly find myself contemplating to be or not to be. And I decide I can't live without this jacket. I love it too much. I simply can't go on. So slowly, I rise from the bathtub. I walk over to the medicine cabinet, staring at myself in the mirror, thinking, can I go through with this? And then suddenly a thought occurs to me and I hesitate. When I'm gone, what's my grandmother going to do with my Michael Jackson thriller jacket? And I, I think it over, and it takes me only a few seconds to realize I don't even care about the thriller jacket anymore. And that's how I know that my love for the lime green bolero cut gold button pleather is real. So yeah. I'm ready to meet my maker and end my suffering. I take a deep breath and I slip the jacket on, thinking I might as well go out in style. And I calmly open up the medicine cabinet. I look around, I see Q-tips, his toothpaste, what else? Dental floss. And then finally, I spot the only medicine in the cabinet. I pull out the bottle and examine it, discovering the strongest thing we have is a laxative. Damn it. What should I do? I, I, I decide that instead of offing myself out, I'll, I'll just go sulk in my room and give my grandmother the silent treatment forever. And so the next day, we go and return the jacket that I bought. And I'm not happy, but I've gone through all the stages of grief and reached acceptance. And she takes me to Macy's to pick out another one. And guess what? To my surprise, what my grandmother chooses for me, this black tuxedo style jacket with a rounded lapel is so classic with such a timeless silhouette, I could wear it today and be perfectly in vogue. And I adore it. And what I came to realize almost immediately after that experience, specifically in the case of the Jimmy Jazz jacket, a problem that literally felt like the end of the world to me was actually far from it. Now, in all honesty, I don't think I would have hurt myself had there been something stronger in the medicine cabinet, but who knows? You know, kids do dumb things. But since then, I've found that if I can take a step back to consider my situation and give it some time to see it for what it is, then usually things are not as hopeless as I might think. And that's my testimony. Thank you. So 
Back in December 2005, I was living in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I was invited to do a three-month sailing journey from Greenwich, Connecticut to Cuba and back in a 42-foot sailboat with two masts with a crew of six. Now, there's a fair bit of preamble to this story, so I'm going to start by introducing you to the crew. Their names have been changed. So first we have Charles Duncan, American and our captain. He's just celebrated his 68th birthday. He's a lifetime sailor. I mean, at the age of 16, he lied about his age so he could join the Navy to fight in the war. That's the kind of man he is. He's booming, demanding, larger than life. And love him or hate him, you absolutely respect him. And he is now en route to fulfill one of his lifelong dreams, sailing to Cuba. Then we have Sylvain, his best friend, many years his junior and his first mate. He and I had just met in Halifax about six weeks earlier at a wedding reception. And after three weeks of a casual friendship, he traveled back to Greenwich to prepare for the three month journey to Cuba. And he'd, rec he'd recommended me to the captain who had a side passion of teaching landlubbers how to sail and turning them into sailors. Then there's Jim, American, a friend of theirs who also lived in Greenwich and our medical officer. He had once been a dentist. Paul, a friend of Sylvain's from the south shore of Nova Scotia, Canadian with dual citizenship to Germany. He's our chief engineer. And he'd been an engineer of a fishing vessel many years before and had experience working on rough seas. He also had a prosthetic leg because he'd lost his in a fishing accident, ending his career on the ocean, which he loved. Tom, just 19 years old, was Paul's son. And Tom had only sailed once before, during which time an unexpected hurricane chased them to a cove where they had to drop anchor, race to shore in a dinghy. And from shelter on the island, this poor kid, about 17 at the time, watched his first sailboat splinter and they all had to be rescued later by the Coast Guard. And he was here because his father wanted to undo the psychological damage and fear that had resulted. Their relationship was somewhat strange because poor Tom had no interest whatsoever in participating in this journey. And finally, last but not least, the me, the lone female on board. Now, I'd sailed a few times, always in a protected harbor, always within sight of land. <laughs> Honestly, if anything had happened, I was always close enough to swim to shore. I had zero open water experience, and I was prone to seasickness. And as it turns out, so was Tom. So not so brief history of events. Paul, Tom, and I, we had been invited on this journey because at the time, Americans were not allowed to trade with the enemy, which means they could be on Cuban soil, but they couldn't spend money there. So to fulfill this dream voyage, Charles needed non-Americans who could do all the purchasing on behalf of the crew, enter the Canadians. Now we'd arrived about 10 days before shoving off, which was scheduled for February 3rd to prepare and provision the boat. Again, Tom and I had never really sailed before. So the captain was excited to convert land lovers to sailors, but, his family was less thrilled. I later learned they had tried desperately to stop him from doing the trip, as had my own family, in fact. And a side note, insurance companies won't insure sailboats on the Atlantic from November through April because it's hurricane season and we're sailing in February. So the morning we were shoving off, the captain's wife arrived with legal documents for him to sign over his power of attorney in the event of emergency. And May I just take this moment to say that I do not have a solid track, track record for heeding red flags. Every experienced sailor at the Yacht Club kept saying we were crazy. My family said I was crazy. We didn't have a lifeboat. It was a friend of the captains who showed up with emergency SOS lights to attach to our life vest for when, not if, but when we went overboard. And when Charles finally acquiesced to getting a lifeboat, it was one that had to be pumped up with a bicycle pump not a self-inflating emergency vessel that inflates in seconds. So all of these things probably should have given me a heads up that things were not going to go as planned. And we're off. Day one, February 3rd, 2006. We have a lovely send off from the docks. There's excitement and relief that we got it all done. And we're a few hours into it, heading up the Long Island Sound towards the race, which marks the end of protected waters and the transition to open seas we lose engine. So Paul, the engineer, steps up to the plate and jury rigs a gas can with copper wire to bypass the part of the engine that won't take fuel, and we are underway once again. Yay, cheers, high fives all around. We think we're awesome. We won the first challenge. It's a beautiful night, and we're on the water. Day two, open ocean. We're officially sailing the Atlantic. I'm excited and a little queasy, but I'm fine, and so is Tom. 
but the winds pick up and the water gets choppy and Tom and I begin to get seasick. By the end of the day, we're both laid out flat down below after having heaved up our very souls into the ocean. Now, during this time of horizontal survival, the boat loses the mizzen sail, and that's the second sail, the smaller sail, but we've still got the main sail on the carbon fiber mast, which is the strongest you can get. It's Charles Pride and Joy, and it's still standing tall. Amen. We're hindered, but we're fine. Onward. Days three and four. I'm in and out of consciousness. I'm weak. I can't speak. I can't move, but I do have very vivid memories of rolling off the berth a few times in rough waters, hearing yells and shouts from the crew above me as they fight the storm and the crashing waves and of watching and listening to those waves as they pound against the portals above my hair, head and it's clear we're going to sink and I know there's only a small chance we're going to survive it and I know this in my bones. Now, I've been struggling with depression for months and I left Halifax for a number of reasons so I, I really didn't care if I lived or died. So. I was at peace with the idea, but I knew my family would not survive the loss so easily. So I have my talk with God. I apologize, I make promises. There's no need to negotiate, he's all knowing. He knows my truth better than I do. And he knows that I have no personal fear, only that for my family, which I believe is why he didn't take me. It wasn't for me, it was for them. But at the time, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. So I started to imagine what it's like to drown with the image of Kurt Russell writhing in the death and drowning scene in the remake of the Poseidon Adventure. And I prepare myself for the burning sensation of salt water in my sinuses and my eyes and the dark of the ocean at night and being underwater, not being able to tell up from down and gasping for air, but inhaling ocean. And I, but I, I remind myself, it's only gonna be 60 seconds or so before I lose consci consciousness. It's okay, it's, it's not the worst way to go. Others have gone this way. At, at least I'm gonna go out having done something. I'm fine and I accept it. Still, day four, I think. A few hours later, maybe, I'm not sure. But I've begun to come back to life, still aware we're probably not going to make it, but the storm is less violent. But Charles refuses to let me help up deck says I'm too small, I'm not strong enough, and I'm too easily swept overboard. And I point out that I'll be tethered and I really wanna pull my own weight. And I'm so embarrassed that I'm not an active member of the crew, but he points out that it'll take too much energy from the rest of the crew to pull me back in if I get washed over. And I see his point, he's right. So I stay down below, begrudgingly. Day, hmm, really not sure if the order of events and what day it is at this point, everything is foggy. But at some point, Charles, our captain, he loses consciousness and slips into a coma. And at 4 a.m., they put me on watch. It's too rough to be up deck, which is the tradition. So Sylvain stations me down below at the navigation table instead with eyes on the radar. And I've been told to wake him immediately if I suspect another vessel in the area because they're likely pirates. And as the sole woman on board, I'm at the high risk, highest risk. And I'm also told that the dots on the radar will look the same, whether it's a vessel or a cluster of storm clouds raining down lightning and rain. And I'm told to use my intuition to determine the difference. I've never watched a radar before. I'm not happy with these instructions, but the crew crashes, they go to sleep for much needed rest, leaving me in charge. <laughs> of course, 20 minutes later, there's a cluster of dots on the radar and another crash of waves on the boat, which frankly was, were never ending. We're being knocked around, but I have a sense something's, something's different. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, what do I do? Do I wake Sylvain? Do I not wake Sylvain? Do I? And I look up and I see Sylvain, wild eyed, making his way through the middle of this boat that is knocking us all over the place. And he rushes past me up the hatch and he slams open the hatch, pokes his head up through to look around. Rain is pouring in and he slams it closed again, runs back down, grabs the spotlight, goes back up and he's waving it around in the sky. And I have no idea what he's doing. I just know that we're both getting really wet. And then he screams, we lost the mast, we lost the mast. All hands on deck, we lost the mast. Men everywhere, life vests, tethers, knives and hands, bodies shoving their way through the hatch. Put on your life jacket, stay with Charles, stay out of the way. 
I have my orders. Panic? No. I stay calm throughout. I do as I'm told. I'm a goddamn rock star. <laughs> Meanwhile, the crew cuts away loose lines to, to free the carbon fiber mass from the boat so it doesn't sink us. And remember, this is an unbreakable mast and it has just broken. The fiberglass boat is probably going to be next. Adrenaline hangovers all around. <laughs> We've made it. In the morning light, the storm has passed. We're reassessing our situation, exhausted, worried. We go for a swim. We need to wash off the last few days of peril before squaring our shoulders for the next few. Laughing with relief and pro tip, covered in soap to protect from the cold water, I go in twice. But when someone mentions the possibility of sharks, I call it a morning and I am ready for lunch. Sylvain and Jim make the most incredible meal I've ever had in my life. It's my first meal after three days of seasickness and almost going down with the ship. And this is when I learned that the unusual thing I'd heard while manning the radar the night before had been the carbon fiber mast splintering and separating from its mount in the hold of the ship. And that the only reason it didn't puncture the hull while it was spinning and thumping against the inside of our boat was because we had an inexperienced crew who didn't know how to bundle the lines. That's ropes for you land folk. We had loosely tossed them into the hold. So when the mast became a sledgehammer, spinning and pounding against the inner hull of our ship, those loose lines created a buffer or padding. And again, the only reason the mast didn't put a hole in the side of our hull was because we didn't know we were supposed to coil the lines before stowing them in the hold. Inexperience saved our lives, which brings us to the moment that truly stands out for me. It's midnight-ish, dark, moody, windy. The seas are swelling behind us, giving us some momentum to our new destination, Bermuda. We need to get to land ASAP to get Charles the medical attention he needs. I have just finished my four hours at the helm with Tom on watch. And Jim has just taken over for me and Paul has taken over for Tom and they have a 40 ounce of whiskey between them. Music is blaring from down below so loudly you have to shout to be heard, even on deck. But Tom has gone down below to get some sleep and the music is too loud for me. So I tether myself to the rail, grab a seat cushion as a blanket and let the waves wash over me as I watch the two fools on duty drink and revel in our survival. But I'm quietly angry. We haven't called for Coast Guard assistance for our captain. And I'm pissed to have been told I was overreacting because, and I quote, you're just overreacting because you're a woman. Also, I'm really, really tired. So it's at this point that Jim leans forward to offer me the whiskey. I wave my hands, no, when he raises a bottle high in the air and screams, yeah, even the triangle can't get us now. <laughs> And he starts laughing maniacally, at which point I launch myself out of my seat and across the pit, lunging to wrap my hands around his throat. I saw red. How dare he tempt the fates? We're in the middle of the flipping Bermuda Triangle, and this guy has just told that it can't catch us. And to this day, I don't know what would have happened if I had managed to reach him because in my rage, I had forgotten that I was tethered to the seat. So in midair, I was snapped back, man knocked out of me, and I land hard on the deck, wet and furious. And these two idiots laughing and oblivious, hooting and guzzling and doing generally all the things that made me want to kill them didn't even notice. So I did the only thing I could. 
I channeled my inner pirate. I took their bottle of whiskey, guzzled, and then leaned forward, oops, and let it slip through my wet fingers onto the deck. And I watched their looks of horror as the liquid gold poured forth. My offering and appeasement to the triangle. Yar. of my two older brothers. Growing up, I was slightly outcasted as a sibling considering they're twin brothers and I was the annoying little sister. So now as adults, I find myself creating my individual relationships with them. For instance, I don't know how it came about, but me and my brother Dominique bond over physical activity. I want to say I inspired him once I completed three half marathons and he always mentioned how he thinks he can do it as well. So for shits and giggles, we did a tough mother, mother race together. For those of you who are unfamiliar, that's pretty much a seven mile run with about 20 obstacles done in a lot of mud. From crawling under barbed wire fence to sliding into a pool of ice cold water. But honestly, it's really fun and slightly challenging. So for Christmas 2018, I figured we up the ante a little. I gifted him tickets for him and I for Spartan Race registrations. The Spartan Race is as I described the Tough Mudder, but on steroids longer miles and more obstacles. I've always wanted to do one and I love challenging my body so I figured why not do it together. Fast forward to race day April 27th 2019 and we're driving all the way up to some place in Jersey where all reception is lost. We park our car and head to the bus which then drives us another 20 minutes to drop us off at the official Spartan Race location. We see all the runners and start to get really excited. These people take the race real serious. They have all this equipment on them, the backpacks with the water fountain thingy attached to them and all. It's very impressive. We checked in and start walking to the start line. Our adrenaline rush since our wave starts in less than an hour. And we start to talk to our fellow, fellow Spartans. We noticed that each Spartan knew straight out the gate this was our first Spartan race and we couldn't figure out how we stuck out as sore thumbs. And finally, one Spartan says, well, you're wearing Nike running shoes. Anyone who's done a Spartan race before would know that you need these shoes. She pointed to her shoes, which has these massive cleats on them so that it's easier for you to get a grip on inclines. That same Spartan continues to say, this is your first Spartan race and y'all are doing a beast? Wow, amazing. Aww, that's so sweet of her to give us words of affirmation. I love it here. We feel even more pumped to start. I'm feeling great. We're in our way of getting ready to be sent off as the guy on the mic is hyping us all up. We are Spartan. The horn blows and we are off. We are off to what feels about a 20% incline on our first mile. What the hell did we sign up for? I ain't even 20 minutes in and I am winded. We come to our first obstacle and it's a 10 foot wall. Literally, that's it, it's a wall. And you're supposed to just hike yourself up over the wall, all arms. There were no foot pedals. So my brother kneels down and told me to use his knee as a stepping stool. This gave me leverage and I was able to fold myself over the wall and kind of do like this involuntarily flail over. <laughs> and after I was over the wall, my big bro easily did a quick jump, grabbed the top of the wall and literally pulled himself over. This was the first obstacle and I couldn't even do it without him. This is wild. We continued to run through the course, which was honestly dangerous. It wasn't a flat pad path at all, just sticks, rocks, uneven land, and mother nature vibes. And did I mention this is all happening on a mountain? <laughs> like a lot of the obstacles was focusing on arm strength with I literally have no arm strength. So it ended up with my brother helping me out with a lot of obstacles. But after a while, naturally that started to win him out. After being on the course for about three hours, we were only at mile four. There's 13 miles in total. I wanted to cry because who the hell I did was this? Uh, oh, right. It, it was mine. You're right. It was mine. 
So around mile 10, my brother catches a nasty Charlie horse, which pains him terribly whenever he has to walk up on an incline, which I remind you, we are on a mountain, so we are always on an incline. I was giving him different stretches to do that I think helps ease the pain, and a fellow Spartan immediately in passing says, Charlie horse? Damo nods at him. The fellow Spartan then takes his backpack off, places it on the ground, and whips out a bottle of mustard. We looking at him like, bro, this ain't a time for a cookout. What are you doing? He says to Damo, open up. Obviously, my brother and I are confused as fuck. Then the Spartan says, mustard aids in instant leg cramp relief. Who knew? So my brother threw his head back as the mustard Spartan filled his mouth up with a big gulp of mustard. And literally in a minute, the pain was gone. But it only seems to relieve him for about 30 minutes or so. Along the way, random Spartans were passing him mustard packages whenever he was bent over next to a tree. I'm starting to get sad and lose momentum because I was slowly losing my fellow Spartan, my teammate, my brother. I go over and act as his crutch so he can lean on me. As he hunches over, all of his 220 pounds and six foot stature leans on me. And I take one step and I take another step and then blank. Next thing you know, my brother in the Spartan is kneeling over me. Did, did I, wait, hold on. Did I just pass out? Like, what's going on? That ain't cute. <laughs> the random Spartan says, eat this banana. I bite into it and it's like I hadn't eaten all day. Wait, that's because I hadn't eaten all day. Because in my past runs, which is nothing compared to this run, I don't eat to avoid cramping. The banana Spartan thinks I'm crazy. You haven't learned in, in your first Spartan? No banana Spartan, like this is our first Spartan race. The banana Spartan gasped, what? This is your first Spartan race and you did the beast? Dude, you guys are sick, man. My brother and I gives him a confused look. So banana Spartan begins to explain. There's three levels of the Spartan race. Spartan sprint, three mile race with 20 obstacles. Spartan super, eight miles with 25 obstacles. And then <laughs> there's Spartan Beast, bro. 13 miles with 30 obstacles. Oh, hell no. I'm throwing in my white flag. I'm over it. This is some bullshit. <laughs> However, you can't just randomly, randomly walk off the course because might I remind you, we're on a mountain. So we begin to walk throughout the course until we find a place we can get off. We walked by a few obstacles that honestly, even if I had enough to eat before the race, I still wouldn't have been able to do them obstacles. Just trying to hike up and get through this mountain was challenging enough. Finally, an hour later, which makes it the eighth hour, that is somebody's whole work shift, might I remind you. We've been on the most terrible Christmas gift idea I've ever come up with in, wait a minute, what is that noise? Could, could it be? We can hear the crowd. We can see the finish line. I, I can see the vendors where all the food and Bud Light Bear is. And suddenly I call my second win. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I start doing a light jog and get to one of the last obstacles, which was pulling a 50 pound bag attached to a tight rope all the way to the top and letting it drop once it peaks 30 feet up. I'm feeling good, feeling great. So I inhale, start running, proud and strong because there's a crowd, cameras, and butt light. <laughs> the very last, very, very last obstacle we had to do was literally jump over a fire pit right before we crossed the finish line. And I run full fledged and leaped over the fire pit. I can't believe it. My brother and I completed the Spartan Beast to our best abilities. I was handed my medal and most importantly, my Bud Light Bear. <laughs> I felt so accomplished, I couldn't even believe this. I bonded eight hours with my big brother and we got through this together. He was proud of me as I was proud of him. In some way, shape or form, this medal is a symbol of my relationship with my big brother. I love watermelon. It's the perfect food. It's 98% water and 2% sugar. When I was a kid, I said to myself, there are certain things I'm not going to skimp on when I become an adult. And one of them is watermelon.
I'm in my 20s, newly married, living in a small studio apartment in Toronto with my husband. It's June, watermelon season, which means that on Tuesday morning, I'm sitting by my kitchen table looking over supermarket flyers, and I see one from No Frill Supermarket, which is only a three block away walk through the park, and they have watermelon on sale non-GMO with seeds, because I love spitting seeds. These are huge, are the huge oval shaped watermelons and they're $2 each, limit of five. I go to sleep that night dreaming of all the watermelon I can get. I am so happy, I'm gonna get five. Wednesday morning at 8 a.m., it's when the supermarket opens up, I nudge my husband awake and I tell him, it's serious we have to go to the supermarket now. He looks confused. I mean, he's just woken up, but he goes to the restroom and he gets dressed. I grab my empty backpack so I can carry maybe two on my back and we walk through the park. And that's when he asked me, what exactly are we getting at the supermarket that's so important? Okay. So my husband, he hates the supermarket. I, I don't know why. I mean, I love going there and being surrounded by food, reading the labels, thinking about all the food I can make for dinner. His favorite food is dandelion. I mean, you don't even have to go shopping for that. We're at the supermarket and I grab a large cart and he looks at me and he says, what do we need the cart for? And I say to him, look, look, there's Danny Lion over there. Go, go get it. And I take this cart to this beautiful watermelon display. I mean, it's huge. It's a pyramid. They, there are watermelon inside this large cardboard box and I am going to get my pick. I grab one and I look at it. I try to find if it has that yellow bottom, you know, where it rests and it grew. And there it is. And then I look for the brown streaks. Those are where the bees kissed it. The more brown streaks, the sweeter the watermelon. I then tap it to hear that beautiful drum sound and it is beautiful. I put it in the cart. I look around to see if I can see my husband coming and I can't. So I grab two more and I I see him coming now. So I quickly uh, look them over. Yes, yellow spot, streaks, perfect. Uh, tap, tap. Oh, yes, yes, great. And I put them in the cart and now he's beside me. And he's looking inside the cart. And he says, MJ, that's it, right? You're only getting three watermelon. And so I look at him and I mean, there's a sign that says five's the limit. And he says, MJ, if you get five watermelon, that's it. I'm leaving. So, you know, if my husband was a team player, we would be getting 10, five each, but he's not a team player. And I also know that marriage is about compromise and he has to compromise with me because I've already compromised. I'm not asking him to get 10. I mean, five is the limit. And so I look at him and I get two more watermelons and he looks at me and I look them over and he's still there. And I put the two inside the cart and I see him walk away. But I get the cart full of five watermelons and I wait in line at the checkout. And then I remember my father. My father loves my husband. I'm the youngest of three girls and he's always wanted a boy. And so my husband's become that boy, which is like, come on, I'm better than a boy. And so my husband and him, they go to Blue Jays baseball games together. I'm the Blue Jays fan and they, they drink beer together. I never get offered beer. And I know my father's gonna ask what happened and I'm not a liar. So I realized I have to say, my husband can't compromise. That's what happened. So I pay for these five watermelon and turns out it's less than $10 because they're $1.99 each and I get a nickel change and I bring the cart outside to the supermarket and that's when the cart locks. And I look at these five really beautiful watermelons 
and I try to figure out how am I going to take these five home. It's just three blocks. And then I do what I always do when I face circumstances that seem insurmountable. I give myself a pep talk. I tell myself, you can do it. Myung Jin, you are powerful. You are capable. You are going to grab those watermelons. You're going to carry two in each arm. You're going to put a, a, the fifth in between your legs and you're going to waddle home. And I try. I grab one watermelon and I put it in between my legs and I try waddling and I really can't go far. And I look at this cart and I realize I need to get a refund. My husband's right. Damn. And then I feel a tap on my shoulders and it's my husband and he has his arms out. And so I put two in his arms. I put two in my backpack and I carry one and we walk together through the park. And that's when I realize, you know what? This marriage thing might work out after all. Thank you, that's it. I'm done. <laughs>、I、invented my own holiday,、uh, my own weekly holiday. Yeah, a holiday that's weekly. I'm making it a thing every week on Wednesday. I have a slice of cake. I call it Cake Wednesday. Pretty genius, right?、Uh, once a week, celebrating your life, your wins. But like all things, Cake Wednesday、uh, has an origin story. I was always obsessed with cake. I love it. I mean, what's not to love? It's butter, cream. Sometimes chocolate, sugar, all that's good and right in the world. When I was about seven years old, I went to this birthday party at my friend Sterling's house. My mother was doing something with my sisters that day, so my father dropped me off at the party. When we got to the door, Sterling's mother gave us a strange look, which is what we always got. See, I'm light skinned, and many white people don't recognize that I'm half black. But with my father standing before her, Sterling's mother definitely knew now. She gave a look of shock,、um, but I wasn't really like that phased by it. My mom had taught us that every time we got these weird looks, it was because people thought we were really attractive. So I just was like, well, damn, we cute. All right. Sterling's mom asked my father if he was my father. To which he said, Yep. Sterling's mother was like, Biologically? He said, Yep, the old fashioned way. And I just walked inside the party after my dad said he'd be back in an hour and a half. As I entered the party, something was already off, but I, I, I was immediately sat in a corner at this couch under some very large flags. One giant flag was red with like a weird X. And the a second one was also red, but the X on this one was blue. When I tried to get up to join the fun, Sterling's mother would repeatedly tell me to sit down in my designated corner. During the games, I was told to sit down. During the presents, I was in my corner. And then the cake came out. The cake came out, and this is my moment, my favorite part of any event, the purpose of my existence. So I began to sing Happy Birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy. And nobody's singing that birthday one. So I quickly cover it up and I go, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <sighs> Saved. I'm good. I'm good. I'm totally going to get a slice of cake for this, right? But cake slice after cake slice was passed around, but not to me. I finally could not take it anymore. I got up and I was like, ma'am, can I have a slice of cake? And she was like, no, go sit down in the corner. And so I watched them eat cake. And I think this is like such a big moment in my life because I feel like this is where I truly became obsessed with it. You know, this moment of watching my friends eat my favorite food and being denied it for no reason. 
So now when I'm at an event, I'm like, where is the cake? Immediately, I have to have <laughs> cake. I spent the whole party in that corner, in my shame corner, not even sure what I was supposed to be ashamed of. When my mother and my father came to pick me up, I was clearly upset and I told them what had happened. I was then told to sit in the car. I have no idea what was said. And again, you know, I just thought this was the weirdest thing. It wasn't until the next school day that I got my final lesson from this family. I was uh, walking around the playground and Sterling approached me with her sister. I, uh, I was like, hi, Sterling. And she was like, don't talk to me. You're dirty. You're, a, you're dark meat. I was so confused because I was like, dark meat? Like, what am I, a chicken nugget? Like, I had no idea what she was talking about. And then she said the N-word. She pushed me against the gate of my school and said the N-word. And then just as she's about to punch me, my sister jumped out of the car, who was my sister who was picking me up from school, jumped out of the car and was like, get away from my sister. And they ran off and I told my sister what happened and my sister was like, they called you the N word. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, you got to tell Papa when you get home. So I go home and I was like, Papa, apparently I'm supposed to tell you that these kids called me the N word. And he goes, oh, you never ever let anyone call you the N word. And here's the thing about that. Um, my dad called me the N-word all the time as a term of endearment, so I had no idea it was a bad word. And he explained the origin of the word and how when he says it, it's empowering and how when somebody white says it, it's disrespectful. And I was just so confused. But that was like the first time I realized that somebody could just hate me just for existing. And, you know, now I'm loud and proud about telling everybody I'm biracial for my safety, but also just because I want them to know. I want to be proud of both of the sides of me, both parts of my family. I think it's really important to be proud of who you are. And I am. So should we have a slice of cake now or... So, um, some years ago, I, you know, young, freshly out of puberty, <laughs> and it's a sunny summer day in my old neighborhood on the west side of Detroit. I'm looking for some friends outside to have some fun, you know? I'm sitting by myself on the porch, waiting to see anybody, you know, anyone I can hang out with. And, I see nothing. Hmm. That's unusual. On an average summer day, you can find guys huddled around their cars, smoking cigarettes and talking smack about each other up and down the street. Then there's at least four or five kids in the neighborhood about the same age as me gathered around whosoever house we decided was the hangout spot for the day. So to look around and see nothing, that's a little suspicious. But I gotta hang out with somebody. And I know my friends are somewhere around. They got to be. I decide to investigate. Walking down the street to see if there's anyone around the block or listening for any familiar sounds or voices. At the end of the second block, I hear something. It's a faint voice. In fact, it's multiple voices. I think it's on my right side. I follow the sound. It's coming from Ralph's. Hey, Ralph, Ralph, let me in. Ralph opens his gate and he has the biggest grin I think I've ever seen on his face. Is he just happy to see me? I mean, we're friends, but we're not super close or anything like that. N nothing against him. You know, he'll, he'll just do anything to look or sound cool, which can sometimes put the people around him in an uncomfortable situation. Um, for example, about two months ago before today, 
Ralph was caught attempting to spray paint the inside of an abandoned school building that he didn't realize had a functioning alarm. When in fact, the building had an alarm loud enough for anything within a quarter mile radius to hear it. And actually, the more I think about it, the less it makes sense because if you want people to see what you painted, when you want to put it on the outside of it, you know what, it's not my business. That's Ralph, that, that's your introduction to Ralph. So despite his questionable decisions, he does have a basketball room in his backyard, so we hang out from time to time. <laughs> Although, today is different. My first indication of something being up would be when I walk in and see everyone huddled around Ralph's cousin, Boogie, instead of playing basketball. I lean over and I ask Ralph, um, why is everybody standing around like that? Oh, well, they're probably play, uh, petting Saber. Saber? You let Saber out right now? Saber is Ralph's Rottweiler. Not a very friendly dog to people that aren't Ralph and Boogie. She scares the shit out of me, and Ralph knows it. Um, uh, you know what? Actually, I should get going. I, I can't even stick around that long, so I'll catch y'all later. And uh, no, 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 I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, man. You can see Saber tied up right there, look. Yeah, yeah, she is. So what is everybody looking at? <laughs> hey, Boogie, let me see so I can show Monte. Boogie hands rock what he's holding. My eyes get big. Is that a gun? Yeah, it's a gun. What? What, you never seen a gun before? Um, this is, this is kind of a loaded question for me. You know, growing up in Detroit, you, you do become aware of guns at a young age and you may have even seen one or two hanging out at a friend's house some days. So it's, it's not that I've never seen a gun before but I live under my mother's roof and she hates guns. So much so throughout my entire life, she's held a strict no gun policy. That means absolutely no guns, including pellets, nerf, water, or anything resembling a gun was allowed in the house for me and my older brother. So this is the most up close and personal I've ever been to a gun. Um, how did you get that? Does your mom know you have it? Yeah, man, you know what? That's none of your concern. Don't be asking too many questions. He's being really smug right now as he shows it off. It's a silver revolving pistol with a brown leather handle. It looks like something you see in an old Western. I know I haven't seen many guns before, but I've definitely never seen one of these before. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's get ready to play. All right, cool, cool. Who got first ball? Um, actually, we gonna play basketball in a little bit. Okay. What are we playing now? Russian roulette. What? Russian roulette. Like, like with the gun, how they doing movies? Yeah. Yeah, and actually, actually, you just got here, so that means you go first. Go first for what? You go first to play, boy. I'm gonna spin this chamber, aim it at you, and pull the trigger. What? what? No, 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 I'm not playing that. No, I came here to play basketball. That's that's the only shooting I want to do. And 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 look at everybody else. You all agree to this? I look around at everybody and they're nodding their heads, yes. What the fuck is going on right now? Um, Monte, Monte, I know you're not being scary right now. Well, well, I'm, I'm not being scary, man. I, I just don't wanna get shot. There's only one bullet in here, you'll be good. Here, here, how about I make it better? I shoot, if nothing hits you, I'll give you $20. I'm good, Ralph. Um, 
Actually, I think I'll just head back home, man. Just play. You can't be the only one that don't play. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. So, like I said, I'll see y'all later. And uh, Boogie, grab Saber. Hold her by the gate for me. You, you going to get Saber on me? Yeah. Don't try to run either. Or he'll let her go. She'll chase it. What, are you really trying to kill me right now? Bro, you are not gonna die. How does he know that? I mean, his confidence is confusing me, along with the fact that everyone else is on board. Maybe they messing with me? They gotta be messing with me, right? I mean, it's probably not loaded. Ralph's crazy, but... He's not that crazy. He wouldn't actually do it if I could die, right? Right? All right. Um, so I, I still get the 20 if it doesn't go off, right? Yeah. Yeah, man, you still get your 20. Okay. Okay, I'll play. I take a deep breath. And I close my eyes. Sweat is building up on my forehead right now and I can feel my heart pounding. I keep taking deep breaths in an effort to keep it cool in front of everyone. He's not gonna kill you. 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 Ralph snaps the gun. Then he spins the chamber. Puts it back in place. He lets his arm down. The barrel of the gun aiming directly at me. My eyes are still closed right now. But I can feel his every movement. On three, I shoot. My chest feels heavier now. Is, is, is it too late to turn back? One, two, I hit the ground, complete dead weight, my body feeling limp. The first feeling is immense pain, but then it's numbness. I can't feel my face right now. He hit me, square in the cheek. Monte, Monte, you good? Bro, bro, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to shoot you. I swear, I did not mean to shoot you. I continue to lay on the ground. Everyone now huddled around me with worried looks. And I reached to touch my face. There's no blood. Or at least very little compared to what I thought. And as bad as this hurts right now, honestly, I, I thought it would be a lot worse. It's a BB, man. It's a BB gun. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. Look, let, let me get you an ice pack. And he runs into the house. Everyone, everyone else that's around me, they try to help me up. But I push them off. Because y'all all let this happen. <sighs> I'm going home. And I walk by my lonesome. I'm in so much pain right now. I'm, I'm practically limping. I can feel it through my entire body. And I just make it home. I'm still holding on to my face. I'm hoping my mom isn't nowhere around so I don't have to show her what happened. He 
just as I think I'm in the clear here. Monte, Monte. Damn. Yeah, man. Hey, hey, Rico and a couple of your friends came by a little earlier looking for you. Um, they, they went to the park. They want you to meet, meet they want you to meet them there. Uh, ma, I think I'm gonna relax hanging out with friends for a little while. You know what? I actually might spend the rest of the summer in my room. 